everybody, it's Jeremy. Welcome to a new Dominions 5 series. This is going to be a Nazca multiplayer game. Um, I actually managed to get Nazca in the tournament, in Lucid's uh, 2022 tournament. So yeah, we're going to be doing um, a Nazca series. This is going to be the national overview uh, we're going to have a separate pretender design video because I actually did a lot of um, uh, various testing and, and trying out different moving parts and pieces, etc., etc. So uh, this is probably going to be a long video uh, because there is a lot of stuff going on with Nazca and I tend to be relatively long-winded when uh, it comes to explaining those types of things. As always, a caveat to my videos, I am not an expert at this game. Uh, I am a casual player who just uh, happens to have played a fair amount of games. So anything that I say, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Any opinions that I might have, they are, in, in point of fact, just that, my opinions. Um, Nazca is a bit of a hot button uh topic in the community there's a lot of strong opinions on nazca and after having played uh quite a bit of single player and some multiplayer now with nazca i too have some relatively strong opinions um so yeah uh <laughs> if my opinions conflict with yours hit me up in the comments I, I would love to hear your opinions on why I am wrong, um, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, uh, to kind of kick things off, um, I just think it's kind of funny how I actually ended up getting Nazca. Uh, so in the tournament, we have, uh, there were three available bands, basically. Um, each band took four votes, I believe. I could be I could be misremembering it. It might have been four bands with three votes each, but I think it was three bands with four votes each. Uh, Twelve player game, and um, right off the bat in my game we banned out Ermor and Solaria. I voted for banning Ermor, so I was voting very early on. Um, and the general concept was going to be to everyone else was supposed to ban Nazca, right? But then one of the players in, in like the twilight hour um, decided just to not vote at all, to, to not ban at all, thus leaving Nazca in the pool. And I randomly, after that happened, I randomly got first pick. And when I realized Nazca was still in the pool, I was like, okay, well... <laughs> I will probably never have the opportunity to play Nazca in a competitive multiplayer game. Again. Um, definitely not in a tournament game, probably. Uh, so I might as well pick Nazca. Uh, and I knew in doing so that I was going to paint a target on myself. But at the same time, I had the mentality of, right, like this is something that I'm probably never going to get another good chance to do. And if I don't pick Nazca, someone else is very likely to pick Nazca. So I'm going to have to deal with it one way or the other. I might as well be the one who's actually playing the nation. So uh, that is kind of like the little long and short of, of what we are doing, what the game is, how I got into this position. Um, this video, like I said, is going to be a national overview. So we're going to go over the lore of Nazca. We're going to go over each of the units, each of the commanders talk about um, their specific spells, items, and kind of general tactics. Like I said, this is probably going to be a very long one, so settle in. Hope you enjoy. Um, and uh, <laughs> hit me up with those opinions, because I know people got strong ones when it comes to Nazca. So uh, let's go ahead and kick things off, shall we? Nazca is a mountain necrocracy of winged humanoids. It was once a far-off Kalian colony, but with the fall of the raptors and the disappearance of the Eagle Kings, contact with Kalum was broken, and the descendants of the Eagle Kings became Nazcan Sun Kings, Incas. With the demise of the last Eagle Kings, steps were taken to preserve the wisdom of the kings of old. The necromantic practices of the Raptor clan were not banned in Nazca, and the divine kings were mummified and preserved should their advice be needed in the future. 
priests of the dead began to mummify other influential members of society as well. Since old kings and queens were supposed to be wiser than the living, a council of mummies was formed to aid and guide the Incas. The priests would listen to the mummies and divine their will. Now Nazca has turned into a necrocracy, a kingdom ruled by mummies of the Silent Council. The Sun Kings rule in their name, but it is the mummies of ancient kings and their interpreters who have the true power in the kingdom. The mummies of nobles and priests are transported to and fro to decide in judicial matters as well as to attend feasts and ceremonies. The royal mummies are too valuable to disturb unless the matters at hand are of utmost importance. The ice crafting of Kalem has been lost, and Nazca uses light armors of cloth and bronze. The Nazcans can field vast armies of unskilled soldiers, commoners indebted to the mummies, allied soldiers from conquered human mountain kingdoms, and walking dead reanimated by the mummies of dead priests, or most of the armies of the kingdom. So, uh, Nazca has a very cool uh, lore vibe going on. Uh, obviously, they are a flying nation. Uh, uh, they are a splinter group off of Kalem. Um, so very interesting there. Um, there's a little kind of like early age uh, Kalian kind of concept of um, the the Raptor clan being into necromancy and that creating a civil war uh, within the Kalian Empire. And Nazca is, uh, you know, the, this isolated, hidden away group that actually survived. Um, so pretty neat, pretty interesting. Uh, it's got, obviously, it, it is derivative of actual Nazcan lore. Uh, the Nazcan um, hieroglyphs, not hieroglyphs, geoglyphs in um, South America, right? Uh, heavily influenced by Incan mythology because, uh, to my understanding, and it's a limited understanding, I did not look a lot of this up, uh, there's not a lot out there about Nazca as a, as a civilization. So uh, this is kind of a combo Nazca-Incan um, lore scenario. Um, and it's really interesting. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's, it is a very unique vibe in dominions i do not think that anyone else in dominions does this mummification kind of scenario uh, which is really neat so uh let's talk about national features real quick and then we'll kind of do a high level overview of what nazca is before we actually jump into the units and commanders so national features race we've got flying units obviously uh, inherent cold resistance. This is kind of a holdover from Kalem. Uh, commanders mummified on death. This is a super unique aspect of Nazca and is probably one of the big factors of the nation. Uh, and they prefer cold scale one. So again, another holdover from Kalem. Uh, military, flying units, obviously. Free recruits of low quality, and boy do they mean low quality. Uh, reanimated dead, very neat. Uh, and Sacred Sun Guard. They only mention the Sacred Sun Guard, but Nazca actually has a lot of different sacreds. Um, they are a very sacred-focused nation. Magic, they have fire, earth, death, astral, and air. I don't know why I skipped air. Um, and they have shallow to medium death access in most of those, right? Generally, I think I view, I view shallow access as one to two right? Because it's hard. It can be difficult to climb from one to two. Um, three is that kind of like medium range. Four is, is deep, right? If you have, if you have native fours, um, even if they're just randoms, a hundred percent randoms, right? Uh, native, native fours is you can climb to almost anything. Native threes are more difficult, right? And Nazca sits on that cusp of two to three, um, very easily but it has a hard time pushing into that four on quite a few things, okay? So relatively wide path range, but also relatively mid-tier as far as depth goes. Priests, they have powerful priests, meaning they have recruitable H3s, um, and undead priests can reanimate the dead, so they have reanimator priests. Uh, buildings, they have primitive forts. I'm not really 100% sure on this. I, I didn't... I don't have a very good grasp on what it, some of the terminology in the game means. So 
normally when I see primitive forts on a nation, I'm like, oh, they only have one tier forts, like Yomi in uh, early age. But Nazca has tier two forts, so maybe it's just a scenario of in middle age, tier two forts are seen as primitive because it's only two tiers rather than three tiers, which I think a lot of middle aged uh, nations have access to. Um, but the Nazca is able to get two two commander points out of their their forts. You you don't have any you don't have the issue of like everything's slow to recruit, <laughs> you know, like other other uh, primitive fort early age nations do. So um, there's nothing to worry about there. Nazca has a, a lot going on with it. So from the natural national features, let's talk a bit about kind of like the high level concept of what Nazca is. Nazca has, in my opinion, five main things going on for it. Uh, number one, it is a flying nation. Flying inherently means a different kind of play style, a different kind of threat compared to other nations, right? Um, flying nations have a couple of inherent strengths and a couple of inherent weaknesses. Generally speaking, there are some differentiations, but generally speaking, um, the strengths being that they tend to have very high map move, right? Um, that lets them dictate the pace of combats, or the pace of wars, rather. Um, and they can fly in battle, right? So flying in battle means you have to worry about attack rear commands, you have to worry about um, your formations not really mattering as much, or mattering more, but in a different way, right? Um, so those are kind of like the inherent pros to flying. And then the, some of the inherent cons tend to be lower attack density, right? Because winged creatures tend to be larger than, um, say, a human, even though a, uh, a Nazcan flyer might, o might only have human stats because of their wings. They tend to be larger than their human counterparts, meaning that you can fit fewer of them in a square, so pound for pound, they tend to have lower attack density, lower survivability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that's kind of like the inherent flying kind of concept. So Nazca, one of the five key points of them is they are a flying nation. One of the other key points to them is that they are a, um, a, a very sacred focused nation. Um, so aside from their commanders, they have plenty of sacred commanders, they have five sacred units that they can either recruit or summon. So that's a lot of sacred units. It, it builds in a lot of diversity into their uh, ability to field armies of sacred units. And it means that they tend to be heavily focused on wanting a good bless for their sacreds, right? Um, you don't have to play them that way, but it, it's kind of one of those scenarios of if you're playing Nazca, why wouldn't you play them that way? So Flying Nation, um, heavily focused on sacreds. Uh, another thing that is very big about them is, is that they are, um, they have reanimator priests, right? So reanimator priests, if you are familiar with them, uh, a la scenarios like uh, Ermor, or I guess maybe like Lanka, or there's a couple of nations that have like reanimator priests or have access to special reanimation. Nazca is one of them. Um, it is not a freebie, right? It does take mage turns, and those mage turns can be extremely valuable to you in other ways. So it's not free spawn necessarily, right? But it, it is a way to generate large amounts of chaff that can be very useful, especially in the mid to late game when you're, you're finished up with research goals or you're close to being finished up with research goals. You can then turn your attention to the generation of large quantities of um, chaff. So that's a very big focus on the, the nation as well. Um, Another big focus on the nation is the commander's mummified on death kind of concept. Um, so that is probably the biggest or, or the most unique factor of Nazca is that um, commander's mummified on death scenario. So it makes a very interesting dichotomy between having these um, commanders that are living and 
want to keep them around because they're doing XYZ. But when they die, they are returned to their home province where they are mummified and they turn into a Malqui version of what they previously were. And we'll go into more depth about what that actually means, but it's a very unique mechanic and it's a very interesting uh, thing. It allows you to be a little kind of looser with with what you're doing with some of your, your commanders. Um, and in point of fact, you might actually want to intentionally get some of your commanders killed just to get the mummified version of them uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish in the game. So very, very unique and interesting aspect there. Um, and then the the fifth and kind of like final thing is kind of actually a branch off of that Commander's Mummified on Death mechanic, but it, it is a, a little bit more unique. And that is, is that Nazca has um, one of the special tags in the game. They have innate casters, innate spell casters, um, and in point of fact, they have a super powerful innate spellcaster in the Royal Malqui, which is one of the reasons why Nazca has a very bad reputation in the community. So uh, those are the five kind of like key aspects of Nazca. Flying, heavily focused on sacreds, um, has the ability to generate a lot of chaff, undead chaff primarily, but not just undead chaff. Um, has this mummified commander's uh, unique mechanic, and then has innate spell casters, um, which is extremely powerful. So, um, aside from that, right, I want to talk about, before we jump into the units and commanders, I want to actually talk about the generalized opinion of Nazca in, in the community, Okay. I'm trying to be judicious in my words here. Nazca has a real bad reputation in the community uh, for being overpowered, right? For being for being a nation that you auto ban, or if they're not banned in a game, everyone immediately should dogpile and kill them because they're too strong, they're too overpowered. Um, I have very strong opinions, and so does the community, about this concept. Um, especially after having played several single pl single player games with them and having played them in multiplayer a little bit, and and again, I'm I'm welcoming the differing opinions. Hit me up in the comments. I feel you, right? But I'm gonna throw out my opinion at the beginning of this video, so that you can see where I'm coming from when I talk about things throughout the rest of this video. Okay, and that is is I think. Thanks to some um, some really skilled players and some YouTube personalities. Here's looking at you, uh, Perun. Thanks for <laughs> ruining it for everyone. Um, I think Nazca garnered a reputation for being extremely strong or borderline overpowered, if not actually overpowered. Um, towards the beginning of Dominion 5's uh, life cycle, right? I think that that reputation was warranted when it was earned. But since then, there have been nerfs to Nazca specifically and to some of the mechanics that Nazca utilizes, right? Or utilized, they still utilize them, right? That have weakened the nation overall, but specifically have weakened the nation in the early game, which is where the nation is at its weakest, okay? So, that is all to say, and, and again, I'll, I'll cover this way more as we're talking about specific things. That is to say that I think old Nazca got a reputation for being overpowered, and it kind of deserved that reputation. I think current Nazca has a reputation for being overpowered and does not deserve that reputation fully, right? I do think Nazca is still a strong nation, 
and it should be considered a strong nation. And like any other strong nation, it should not be left to its own devices. You shouldn't just let a Nazca be like, oh yeah, let that Nazca eat that person, and then eat another person, and then go into the mid game really, really strong, and then let's not mess with them at all as they go into the late game. Oh no, Nazca beat us. Yeah, of course Nazca is gonna beat you then. Literally any nation should beat you if you let them do whatever they want and you don't mess with them throughout the entirety of the game, right? But I think currently Nazca is at that spot of if they are pressured consistently um, and they are kept manageable, then they are just that, right? They are manageable, right? Um I think at the end of the day, Nazca is going to be one of those nations where in the hands of a really skilled player, they're a nightmare, right? In the hands of medium skilled players like myself, right? They're just okay, cool, fantastic. So anyways, um, I've waxed poetically about all of this random stuff. Let's actually jump into the commanders. Well, we'll start with the units um, and we'll go from there, okay? So um starting off we, we actually have one of the hot button issues here um this is the hatan runa um i'm gonna talk at length about this and probably condors because those are two of the big aspects that are different between nazca now and nazca when it earned its reputation for being overpowered right um so i'm probably gonna spend more time on this and condors and sacreds and things like that than i do on a lot of the other units but that's because they're way more important for specific reasons hot runa are a crap slave unit but they are flyers right so um like all of the other flyers they're going to have the cold resistance they're going to have mountain uh, survival all of the other flyers in nazca that is um they're going to be flying they do not have good stats they are size three so their attack density is relatively four poor they're super cheap right um they're super low upkeep cost but you don't buy these i mean you can but you don't you don't buy these normally um, the big deal about the Hatan Runa is that these guys, the Malquis, are slavers, as are the Royal Malquis. So you can use them to get slaves in a province and generate large quantities of Hatan Runa very easily, okay? However, and this is going to be one of those uh, big differences between Nazca now and Nazca previously right i i am paraphrasing this and i'm working off my memory so if i'm wrong legitimately let me know in the comments because i think i'm right but i might be misremembering it it used to be when you used the get slave action right what you would do is you would generate a certain amount of your slaves in the province that you're using or you're using that action in. Um, and that would be it. Okay? So, what you used to be able to do is take several Malquis, put them in a province, and then just create a metric shit ton of Hatan Runa. Now, they are crap units, but it doesn't matter if they are crap units if you can just generate a crap ton of them without any real cost, right? Um, obviously, they still do have an upkeep cost, but if you can generate a thousand of these, uh, it's it's worthwhile, even if they are crap units, because they're still flyers, they're still siege chaff, they're still raiders, right? And if you're not paying for them, you don't really care if they die, you can just throw them to the wind, right? So that made them extremely potent. Uh, it was a very common practice with old Nazca to just get a couple of Malquis early on in the game in your first couple turns um, and then just start generating massive quantities of Hatan Runa. All right. Now, though, they have they Illwinter has since this is quite a long time ago, actually, that they did this, but they changed the mechanics around acquiring slaves. Um, and that is, is that whenever you use the slaver action to acquire slaves, it now generates unrest in the province that you're doing that in, right? Um, 
to my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, it didn't used to do that. So there wasn't really a penalty for acquiring slaves. Now it does. It generates unrest in that province, meaning that if the unrest gets too high, right, or it, period, any unrest, you're losing, um, you're losing income in that province. If the unrest gets too high, you can't recruit in that province, and you also can't acquire slaves in that province if the unrest gets too high, right? So you have to constantly be patrolling that province, meaning you're going to be losing population in that province, right? So there's this fluctuating scenario where you have to use some of the people, generally some of the people, you don't have to use them, but uh, generally the practice is, is you use some of the Hatan Runa that you're producing, that you're acquiring, to patrol down the province, but you're going to basically patrol that province into the ground because you are acquiring slaves from it. So um, it makes that whole process cost something now, whereas it didn't used to, not really, right? Um, so now there is a pro and con to using the Hatan Runa, whereas it used to just be basically all pro, right? Like, there was no reason not to generate a crap ton of Hatan Runa as long as your economy could handle the upkeep and they're super cheap, so generally you could, right? Um, and then you just abuse the crap out of them to raid, siege chaff. It, these guys are crap, but they're still flyers. They're crap, but, but you can still buff them, right? Um, so it's that scenario of, of it, it was just an overpowered mechanic. That does not work in the same way that it does anymore. You can still generate large quantities of Hatan Runa, but it costs, right? You have to, it's like building infrastructure. You have to set up the mechanics to keep that province able to generate Hatan Runa. And you're basically guaranteeing that that province is not going to be um, income solvent. Uh, and if you don't, do it correctly, you'll actually screw yourself out of being able to generate Hatan Runa in that location. So, uh, big deal, right? Big deal, and I took eight minutes to talk about it because this was a very powerful point for, for Nazca, and it is still a powerful point for Nazca, but it's less of a powerful point now. It's, it's more balanced at this point. Um, and this is part. This is where the free recruits of low quality comes in during the national features, right? Is specifically these guys being able to generate large quantities. Okay. Next up, we have on units we have our human warriors. Um, we have several different variants of them. Almost all of them are complete crap. You don't play Nazca because you need human walkers you play nazca because you're playing with flyers right so it's very rare that you're going to use these it's very rare that you're going to want to use them or have a purpose to use them if you have a secret trick uh by all means let me know down in the comments i'd be very interested to see what people use these guys for but for the most part i'll talk about a few things but for the most part you're not going to use these um so they do have the nazcan cold resistance um and mountain survival right because nazca is in theory all around the mountains but all of them are also undisciplined. Mediocre stats across the board, they're just base human warriors. This one is a very cheap spear-only version, no shield. This is a very cheap spear version with a shield, so just slightly more expensive um, with a little bit more defense. Um, this is a mace version with a javelin. If you need some javelins, can be okay. This is a mace version with a sling. If you need some slings, can be okay. So these guys, actually, the specifically the sling versions are kind of the, what I would consider the only really useful ones. If you need large quantities of slingers to do something like a flaming arrows play, like that type of concept, these guys can be okay to do that with. I would still prefer doing them, doing that type of thing with the Aukak runas, right? The archers. Um, but if you need the slings, you can generate large quantities and, and use that, right? That's the only thing that I can think of to really utilize these guys for. Otherwise, they're crap. They have bad stats, uh, nothing remarkable about them, and they are uh, undisciplined, so that makes them relatively difficult to use, okay? Um, next up, we have these four. Um, these are all the Alquak Runas. Um, uh, heads up, I will mispronounce a shit ton of things throughout this video, so... 
I apologize. I'm not a linguist. I, I will do my best. And if you actually have correct pronunciations, let me know in the comments because I will try to remember them and use them the next time I talk about stuff. So, um, anyways, we have four versions of the Aukak, Aukak runas, um, and each of these is roughly the same but with a different weapon. So we have the Spearman version, we have the Mace version, we have the Hatchet version, and then we have the Archer version um, that also comes with a Mace. Each of these has a different use, but generally speaking, as Nazca, you're going to be wanting to focus on your Sacreds, which you have two recruitable versions and three summonable versions. Um, so while you can use these to supplement your forces, and you probably will, especially in the early game, um, in the late game, you tend to be spending your money elsewhere, right? Um, the Spearman version is nice because they have a charge bonus. Alpha striking um, can be very important for flyers. In fact, it's super important for flyers. So these guys can be very, very useful for that type of situation. Um, putting something like Strength of Giants on them, which is a very big spell for this nation, can be very, very useful, right? Uh, bumping up their strength to 14 means they get a plus 7 on the charge. 14 means they're hitting at 17 with a plus 7 on the charge, meaning they're doing 24 damage with a Bronze Lance on that Alpha Strike, um, which is not bad, honestly, for a 10 gold, 7 resource, 9 recruitment point unit. Um, can be very useful. These things die in droves, though, so you're not going to want to rely on them very much. The Maceman, Macemen are a mace version. If you need a bludgeoning weapon for some particular reason, use this version. That's, that's that. Um, same thing with the hatchet, right? If you need a slashing version, use the hatchet. There you go. Um, the archers, right, are kind of a unique scenario because, again, if you want to do something like a flaming arrow play, which is very easy and viable for... for um, Nazca, you can use these. They are less massable than something like Pygmies or Marcadas, right? So they're not going to be the greatest flaming arrow targets in existence. But what they have that Pygmies and Marcadas and things like that do not have is that they're flyers, right? They have map move 18. So you can fly in a bunch of Alkak Runa archers and do a flaming arrows play in surprise way easier than you can with something like a stack of pygmies or marcadas or the typical flaming arrow equivalents right um so while these are going to be more difficult to get up to that threshold of just you know hell rain down um it is still useful because you have such high map move on them uh, the other thing that is a, a little difficult about the Alkak Runa archers is the same thing that's pretty difficult with most archer units, and that is they'll kill the shit out of all your regular stuff. So um, just keep that in mind when you're trying to use these. Uh, it, they can be a double-edged sword. So that is the basic lineup of troops. And then we have two sacred versions. Um, these are cap only. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna look at them via comparison to one another because they're both important sacreds, but they both have different utilizations, right? Um, so one of the things that I want to throw out before we talk about sacreds with Nazca, we're gonna talk about these two, and then we'll talk about the other three later on when we talk about the spells, right? Um, but I want people to be cognizant of this while we're talking about any of the sacreds. And that is, is that while Nazca is a very sacred-focused nation, their sacreds are not, um, they're not Swiss Army knives, okay? They are not do-everything sacreds. They are, so quintessentially, they are not giant sacreds, and they are not elf cav sacreds. Those being the two kind of like, uh, sacred model types that generally, if you put a good bless on those two, they can just do whatever you want them to do and you don't have to worry about them anymore, right? Um, send five giants out with a, a commander to bless them and they'll kill any PD that you have to worry about. Send five uh, elf cav out with a commander to bless them and they will take on any PD and expansion that you have to worry about, right? Um, Nazca does not have that kind of sacred. <laughs> Nazca's sacreds are 
are hammers, right? Um, but they're kind of paper hammers. They will get obliterated if they do not have a critical mass or if they do not have a, a, a very intensely hellish bless. And even in the case where they have an intensely hellish bless, they can still get obliterated because they don't have the defensive statistics or the HP to keep them alive long enough, right? Compared to, again, uh, elf cab or giants. So, again, Nazca is very focused on sacreds, but you have to use their sacreds in a proper kind of manner, or else their sacreds will just die. Um, so, let's take a look at what we're working with here. Condor Warrior and Sun Guard. Both of these are cap-only recruit. The Condor Warrior is slightly cheaper at 20 gold, 8 resources, and 23 recruitment points, whereas the Sun Guard is 23 gold, so 3 more. 14 resources, so six more, and 27 recruitment points, so four, four more, right? So resources really being the big differentiating factor there. Um, and why is that, that the case? Well, because the Sun Guard has better protection at 12 um, versus 9, because the Condor Warrior is using reinforced cloth armor uh, and a hide shield, whereas the Sun Guard is using bronze armor and a regular shield, okay? So Sun Guard has a better protection situation. Um, other than that, they are relatively close to the same in stats. The Sun Guard has one point more in attack and has one point more in morale, I believe. Yes, so 12 versus 13 and 12 versus 13 for attack and morale. Other than that, their stats are the same except for their protection. Um, where they differ, and this is very important, right, is, is that the Condor Warrior has storm immunity. Storm immunity is a very big thing for Nazca. It's a very big thing for flyers as a whole. If you do not have access to storm immunity or you're not thinking about storm immunity and you run into a battle and your opponent throws up storm, it can royally fuck you. <laughs> your, your, most of your game plan, especially in the early to mid game, is based around the concept that you go up in the air and then you land down on the enemy. <laughs> if you can't do that, your your flyers actually turn into very low speed crawling units that don't get to do a, a crazy alpha strike on the back row, right? Um, so storm immunity is a very, very useful option. Sun guards do not have storm immunity. So... What they have instead is a bodyguard too, which is not a big deal. What they really have instead is a sun mace, which is a magic weapon. It's a good magic weapon that is three times uh, effectiveness versus undead and demons. So what you're trading here is um, storm immunity with a bronze lance, so lance charge, right? Versus um, higher protection, no storm immunity, sun mace, magic weapon, right? So that's the kind of like trade-off between Condor Warriors and Sun Guard. Typically, what you will do is you'll use more Condor Warriors at the beginning of the game because they are cheaper via resources and gold, and it's easier to get a critical mass of them compared to the Sun Guard. Um, and then you'll typically swap over to Sun Guard as you need access to higher damage Sun Maces for magic weapons. Um, and then towards the mid game, it's kind of a scenario of, do you need more storm immunity? Get more Condor Warriors. Do you not need storm immunity? Get more Sun Guard, generally speaking. So obviously that is going to change depending on your bless, depending on what you have designed your bless to be. Um, but generally speaking, your Condor Warriors are your early game focus. Your Sun Guard are your replacement for Condor Warriors as you go further, or it's... Do you need storm immunity? Do you need magic weapons? Okay. Other special things to note about both of these units, and I said this prior, but they absolutely want strength bonuses, right? They want strength of giants. They want strength on their bless. These things do not hit very hard, um, especially not compared to something like a giant or something like that, right? But if you do put something like Strength of Giants on a Condor Warrior, again, you're looking at 18 damage um, for the Lance. And then on the Charge, you're looking at another 7. So you're looking at 25 damage on the Charge. 
that's pretty good, right? Um, and then on the Sun Guard, you're actually looking at just a base 26 damage all the time. Uh, or, sorry, not 26 damage all the time. 22 damage all the time. Uh, if you do the typical plus 4 strength bonus, um, you can get Condor Warriors up to 29 on the Lance Charge and Sun Guard up to 26 on uh, a base attack. So, uh, they're, they, they really want increased damage. <laughs> Um, because, as you can see with their stats, right, they are not especially tanky. They do not have super high HP, they're gonna die. They do not have super high defense, they're gonna get hit. They do not have super high protection. When they get hit, it's going to hurt, right? So, what, what Condor Warriors and Sun Guard both, and really almost all Nazcan Sacreds, really focus on is can they kill the thing before the thing kills them? Um... Can they kill on the charge? Can they kill on the alpha strike? And that's that's really the big deal. So um, keep that in mind as as you're you're looking to build a bless for Nazca. So uh, that is going to be it for the base units. There are other units. We will talk about them um, when we get past the commanders. We'll go and do. A, I have a test game up that shows off all of the units. So we'll talk about them there. Um, so yeah, let's jump into the commanders. This is going to be relatively uh, important, a long section. So starting off, we have the Runanaka, Runanacha, I don't know. Uh, this is just a good scout unit. Um, base scout cost, uh, it is a flyer, so you have map move 20, so you have really good range on a scout, and it's base uh, stealthy 55. So um, these are better than basic scouts. You're going to want plenty of these because having a good network of knowledge is very useful for a flying nation. Um, this is probably one of the better scouts in the game. Not as good as a Black Harpy or anything like that, obviously, but pretty, pretty good, right? Uh, you're going to want several. Uh, next up, you have the Karaka. This is your human tier leader. It is 30 gold, 60 leadership. This thing is as, as base bottom of the barrel as you can get as far as indie commanders go right or comparatively um generally you are not going to want very many of these they are not super useful but you will probably have a couple of them to ferry basic troops around here or there um next up you have the apu and the apusquipe and these are where we start getting into the commanders mummified on death tag so all of these are going to be discussed at length in combination and comparison to one another. So let's talk about this. We have the Apu, who is 40 gold, um, 60 leadership, so not a great leader. Nothing else really um, to note about them. And then we have the Apusquipe, which is 70 gold, 80 leadership. Again, nothing really of note about them. Um, you're paying 30 more gold, which is a hefty price, for 20 more leadership. So you're basically doing 30 more gold for can you do formations and get a squad morale bonus. Um, sometimes you are going to want that squad morale bonus and those formations. But a lot of times in this game, flyers especially, don't care about formations for the most part, right? Because they're going to go up in the air and then come down around a whole bunch of other units. So, um, if you need the formations and the squad morale bonus, then you can get an Apusquipe. Otherwise, you're better off sticking with the lower cost Apu. Especially, the reason, the other scenario there being is that you have better leaders in the Inca later on that can just lead your actual units. Um, so you don't have to spend extra money on the Apusquipe. If either the Apu or the Apusquipe die, they both have the Mummify tag. If either of them die, then they are mummified back in their home province as a Malqui. Um, you can also just recruit Malquis straight out of the gate for 140 gold. Malquis are sacred, unlike the Apu or the Apusquipe. And really, the, the entire big purpose of them uh, is the fact that they are slavers, right? Um, other, other big differences is obviously with the Apus and the Apusquipes, they have full slots. Um, Malquis do not have full slots. They have a head slot, and then they have some miscellaneous slots. Um, so you are losing that, but you weren't probably using a whole lot of these slots on the Apus or Apusquipes anyways. They're not really thugs. So, um, yeah. 
Malquis are also undead, whereas the Apus and Apusquipes are not, right? So, uh, again, when they die, they are mummified, they're undead, um, and they become sacred undead slavers, basically. So, the only real reason that you want Malquis is generally because you want to generate Hatan Runa, all right? Um, in point of fact, it is a very common tactic still to grab a couple Apu at the beginning of the game, turn two, three, four, that type of scenario, and just get them killed so that you can have some Malquis generating Hatan Runa um, and be able to utilize those Hatan Runa um, as you finish out the early game, okay? So, super useful scenario, very uh, interesting flavorfully, right, from the, the, the Nazkin mummification side of things. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, they are also, all of the Malquis are undead leaders, so if you need to lead undead units around, you can with them. Next up, we have the Akla. Um, the Akla is paired with the Malqui Priestess, um, and the Akla is... A very cheap, relatively efficient research mage. You get Fire 1, Air 1, H1 uh, for 9 research, 100 gold. And that's really about it, right? There's nothing especially important about the Aklas. They're not especially good combat mages. Uh, they're just basically your most efficient researcher. Especially if you have Magic 3, right? Uh, Magic 3, them being... Um, research 12 is pretty good for 100 gold. Um, if you do not have magic 3, if you have drain 3 or no magic, then these things are less useful. Um, and in point of fact, it, it can be, it, it can be a, a low sell on these or a hard sell on these. Um, the kind of like one redeeming feature is, is that again, they are relatively cheap and they are priest one, right? So they can bless your sacreds. Normally, you're going to get a couple of these in the beginning of the game for blessing your sacreds until you get up to your better H3s, um, and then they can take over. And, and or, right, you're using them as researchers because of their cheap efficiency. So, if an Akla dies, they are mummified in their home province as a Malqui Priestess. Um, you can also just recruit a Malqui Priestess straight up for 175 gold. Uh, they cost 70 gold per year, so not horrible, but they have the exact same paths as the Akla does, right? So you are paying more gold, 70 gold per year, versus the Akla's 40 gold per year. Um, so why would you want a Malqui Priestess versus an Akla? Um... Well, they have the same things going on for them as the Malquis do. They're undead. Um, they have inspirational. They are undead leaders with 120 versus 80 for the Malquis, so quite a bit more. Um, specifically, though, the Malqui priestesses have three things going on for them that the Aklas do not. They are fortune teller 10, right? So if you need fortune tellers or you want fortune tellers, that can be a very interesting mechanic. They are reanimators, right? So this is where we go back to that reanimating um, undead chaff scenario. The Malqui Priestess is the first of the reanimators that you can get. So they can just reanimate chaff every turn for you. And they are innate spellcasters. So <laughs> this, is, this is where we start to get to that scenario where people are like, yep, Nazca's overpowered. You have flyers, reanimators, innate spellcasters, etc., etc. Here's the thing. You don't get to just do everything, right? Um, one, when when Aklas die, when, when any of the flyers die, right, and are, are mummified, they're no longer flyers, right? So these palanquins are moved around by Nazkins, but they can't fly, right? Um, they do not have the flying tag. They do have relatively high map move to insinuate the fact that these guys can fly them to a location if they need to. But it is lower than the regular flying movement for most of your units. So that can be a problem, okay? Um, reanimating is really powerful. Yes, fantastic. But reanimating means you're not researching, right? Um, so there is a give and take on that. 
And then the other thing that people complain about is the concept of innate spellcaster. So um, innate spellcaster is a relatively rare ability in Dominions. It is a very powerful ability in Dominions. Um, I don't know that I understood it perfectly prior to playing Nazga, and I'm not, I'm not sure I understand it 100%. So I'm just going to read through this and throw this out there and if i if i'm making incorrect assumptions which i shouldn't be at this point because i've played multiple single player games with nazga and have been playing multiplayer with them so if i'm still if i still got it wrong then something's fucked up right but in case anyone who is watching this has never really interacted with the innate spellcaster tag i'm gonna go through what actually has because it's a really big deal for nazga and it's a really big reason why people view nazga the way that they do so uh, innate spellcasters can cast spells in the same combat round as they move around or attack with normal weapons. So if they move, they can also cast. If they attack, they can also cast. That is very powerful in and of itself. Very good, right? Um, innate spellcasters are never hindered from casting spells by being in melee, and they also disregard spellcasting times, casting all spells at the same rate. So that is one sentence, but those are two very different things, and they're very important different things, right? Um, not being hindered from casting spells in melee means that when you get swarmed, you can continue to attack and cast without fear of reprisal of being when you're casting, right? Um, or from uh, over incumbent over encumbrance of of casting in melee. Um, unlike uh, battle casters, I think battle casters still have to worry about encumbrance, right? Um, I mean, everything still has to worry about encumbrance, but it's not multiplied encumbrance, right? Uh, so that is very powerful in, in a defensive scenario. But the disregarding spell times is the big thing. That's the thing that most people are like, this is horseshit, right? Is the disregarding spell times. Disregarding spell times means if you're casting a spell that has, you know, 100% um, as the tag, that means it, t it takes one turn to cast that spell. Um, if you're casting a spell that has 300%, it takes three turns to cast that spell, right? Innate spellcasters always cast every spell at 100%, right? Every spell, no matter what it is, is cast in a single turn. That is extremely powerful. That means that you can cast super powerful buffs, um, attack spells, uh, uh, battlefield enchantments, etc. in a single turn, which tends to be way faster than other nations can do do that type of stuff. You can do really interesting plays with like um, Master and Slave, Anti-Magic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those are, that is very powerful and people should rightly respect and fear that ability. We're gonna get into a, a little uh, uh, other things though here. So um, the value indicates the number of spells that can be cast per combat round in addition to the normal move, fire, or attack action. So innate spellcaster one means you get to cast one spell per turn, okay? Innate casters cannot be communion slaves of any kind, period, right? They can lead a communion, however, but this will be very taxing for the slaves, whom will receive twice the usual amount of fatigue. So, innate spellcasters can lead communions, they cannot be communion slaves, and when they lead communions, they will burn that communion out twice as fast, basically. They will burn the shit out of that communion. So that's something that is... It has a powerful ability but it is weighted against this other scenario right so you have to be very cognizant of using innate spellcasters with communions because you risk the communions burning out faster than you otherwise normally would right um so innate spellcaster is a very very interesting tag and it is very powerful but what what does it mean on the malqui priestess Honestly, not much. The Malqui Priestess's paths aren't high enough for it to really cast a lot of spells that are longer than one turn casting time anyways. So the, the one turn casting time benefit doesn't really matter. If the Malqui Priestess is in melee with something, 
it's probably dead, meaning that the ability to cast in melee isn't really that big of a deal. You might defend yourself with a couple of low-level evocations. It's possible, right? But but if something gets up on you, you're probably going to die regardless. Um, and the Malkyrie Priestess doesn't have the ability to join communions anyways, right? So the Malkyrie Priestess really does not get much of a benefit at all from Innate Spellcaster. Really what you'll see is, is on the occasion, they will be able to move and cast spells at during a battle, right? Um, and that can be somewhat useful, but it is not game-breaking in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, the Malkyrie Priestess being Fire 1, Air 1, means that they do not have the ability to boost up very well. They can boost up Air in a Storm, if they use Summon Storm Power. So if you know you're going up against enemies that are going to storm you, or you're going to storm yourself for whatever reason, um, then you can do that, and you can do things like Lightning Bolts. You can give Malkyrie Priestesses... Um, uh, fire in a jar or just a fire gem period and they can do phoenix power and then they can do things like pillar of fire later on in the game um so they're not they're not unuseful right it's but they're not all powerful they are a low tier mage so that's the malqui priestess and and we, we spoke at length about the Malkui Priestess because talking about Innate Spellcaster and Reanimation is going to cover us talking about Reanimation and, and Innate Spellcasting for a lot of the other Malkuis. So, uh, jumping into the next tier units, we have the Huron Priest, which turns into the Malkui Priest. So we have the Huron Priest being 235 gold. Um, this is a fair amount of gold for a mage, but it is a four-path mage. You have 100% random. Um, with a, a Priest 2, H2, right? So that is relatively fairly cost, um, considering the fact that it is also a flyer, um, but it has relatively unremarkable stats otherwise. Um, one of the things to point out, by the way, is, is most of these have relatively low morale. That can be a big problem um, for you in the nation. Uh, but anyways... So we have a Earth Deathcaster with a random Air Earth Astral. How good is this mage? This mage is very good. You are very happy to have Huron, Huron Priests. They are very useful um, for a number of different reasons. And there is not a single random that you are not happy to have for some reason. Okay? Uh, they are not the greatest researchers for the gold cost that they have. Um, so that is a little bit of an issue, but they are significantly better battle mages than the Aklas or the Malkui priestesses are. Um, so you're going to tend to want more Huron priests than you do Aklas, unless you're really heavily focused on research. So, um, with Earth 1, Death 2, you have a mage that can do things like Iron Skin, Temper Flesh... Uh, you can do hordes of skeletons. This is a relatively useful mage out of the gate. When you mix in things like air, earth, and astral, you get access to a couple of different things that you're happy with, period, across the board. Air, earth, right, gets you access to some nice forging things like Skutata Volturnus, I believe. Um, and it allows you to do things like flying shield and stuff like that so you can be more defensive in combat. You can also do, I think, rain of stones if you boost up, like if you have the, the right um, boosters or gear or what have you. Um, I believe rain of stones is air earth. So that can be somewhat useful, but it's not generally something that you care about. Um, what is more important from the air side of things is you get the air death cross path, which is super, super useful for things like wailing winds or wind of death. Um, you can do those very easily with Huron priests. You're very happy to do those most of the time. It's a really good cross path for you. Um, that's super useful. The earth ones are amazing you're very happy to get an earth one every single time you get one because that means you're earth two which means you can summon earth power and be earth three um i mentioned earlier that strength of giants is something that you're really really gonna want to use uh to great effect on your sacreds because you want them to be as killy as possible and plus four strength is a really big boon to that um these 
Earth 2s are going to be the way that you do that the vast majority of the time. Um, you can do Summon Earth Power, Strength of Giants, while there's a hold and attack command for your flyers. Or you, if, if you want to just get doubles off and you're willing to sacrifice the gems, you can do two Earth Gems and you can do Strength of Giants, Strength of Giants out of the gates. Um, I, sometimes that works. Sometimes the AI is a pain in the ass and will do uh, will use two gems to cast the single one. So sometimes you have to do um, three gems on them and they'll do two on the first Strength of Giants cast and they'll do one on the second Strength of Giants cast. Um, either way, though, if you need to get multiples off, you can do that and it tends to be very, very valuable, right? Um, Earth 2 is also just useful because if you have Earth 2 and summon Earth Power, you can get up to Earth 4 with uh, uh, Earth Boots, right? So Earth Boots, Earth 2 puts you at Earth 3, you summon Earth Power, you're Earth 4. Earth 4 can do most anything that you need them to do, including things like Earthquake or, you know... Um, protection buffs like army of lead or army of gold those types of things um so that can be very useful for you throughout the game um when your huron priest dot or sorry um the last one is astral astral is very useful for a number of different reasons you can do things like um you know you can use them as magic duelers because you you wouldn't always want to do that but you can use them as magic duelers because when they die they turn into something. You don't immediately lose them, right? Um, so that can be a valuable tactic for you to utilize. They're also just um, astral mages, right? So you can put them in a communion. You can have them lead a communion. You can do plenty of different things with them. Um, astral is probably the least immediately useful portion here, but it's still relatively useful. When Huron priests die, they turn into the Malqui priests. Malqui priests are basically identical for... for everything in that the Malqui priestess is, but just a little bit better, right? Same type of scenario, you can just recruit these straight out of the gate. Um, they have a higher upkeep cost than the uh, Huron priest does, um, but what you get out of it is the same exact paths that your priest already had, um, but you get a better reanimation bonus, right? Um, so you get Reanimator 2 rather than Reanimator 1. You make more undead when you're making undead. Um, and this innate spellcaster, while it is still innate spellcaster 1, is quite a bit more useful for the Malqui Priest because, like I said, right, you can, um, you can cast higher level things. So you can get up to Earth 4 with some Earth Boots and cast... Um, summon Earth Power, which will take you one turn, and then cast Army of Lead, which will take you one turn, right? Whereas typically it would be Summon Earth Power taking you one turn, right? Summon Earth Power is just, um, I always forget. Summon Earth Power. Summon Earth Power, yeah, is 100%. And then uh, Army of Lead is a 200%. So... Um, Army of Lead would normally take you two turns to cast, so the whole combo, Summon Earth Power, Army of Lead, would take you three turns. But with an innate spellcaster, it only takes you two turns, right? So that can be a big deal. Um, that can be a very useful mechanic, and you can actually make use of it on the Malqui Priests, whereas it's not really very useful on the Malqui Priestess, right? So um, innate spellcaster, pretty cool up there. Moving on to the next thing. This is the big tier, right? We have the Inca, Koya, and Royal Malqui. This is where things get really unique. Uh, and I think I think Nazca kind of comes into its own at this point. Um, the, this is a very unique mechanic. And the Royal Malqui is probably one of the best mages in the entire game. So let's talk about what we get with the Koya and Inca. And then what we get out of the Royal Malqui. The Inca... Um, these are both, these are all cap only, right? Everything else has not been cap only. It's any fort. But the Inca, Koya, and Royal Malqui are cap only. Um, they are slow to recruit. Inca and Koya both slow to recruit. The Royal Malqui is not slow to recruit. And you get a very unique mage out of this. Um, 290 gold, 
Uh, relatively okay stats, but not amazing stats. Higher HP than most of your other flyers. Um, okay combat stats. Generally better resistance, which is nice, but still relatively low morale. Um, high leadership or high enough to, to uh, do formations and give a squad morale bonus, okay? You get a Fire 2, Air 2, H3, which is very strong, right? With a 10% random of getting Fire 3, Air 3, or Astral 1. Um, this guy has a couple of unique tags. They have some inherent resistance. We already know they have cold resistance, but they also have inherent shock resistance, which is nice. They are also storm immune, which is good. And these Incas have built in awe. So you can kind of make little thugs out of them, though it can be very risky to do that. We'll talk more about why. They also have a sun spear, which is three times uh, versus undead. And it also just hits relatively hard, right? Like this thing is an 11 damage value weapon, which is no fucking joke. Like going from 12 strength to 26 damage um, is pretty nice. Um, it's also two-handed, two so it amplifies the strength bonus that you're going to get. Um, so this can this can hit very, very hard against the right target. You can actually make little Incan thugs uh, that can one-shot some of the later demons, like Heliophagi or Ice Devils or things like that, um, with the right strength-boosting gear and just leaving the Sun Spear on them. Um, they can come in and just, like, boom, pop them. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, Fire 2 and Air 2 are very useful paths. Um, you can go up to Air 3 with Storm Power. You can go up to uh, Fire 3 with Phoenix Power very easily. And you can do some pretty nice um, evocation casting with that. Uh, it can be difficult to get higher. Because all you're looking at here is a 10% random. But if you are lucky enough to get a 10% random on an Inca for fire or air, that can be very, very useful for you. Um, so that's pretty awesome. The biggest thing about the Incas, though, tends to be that you do rely on a lot of sacreds in Nazca. And Incas are H3s. So you're typically going to want an, H th an, an Inca in every big army to do Divine Blessing on the entirety of your sacred blob right um and then aside from that these guys will be doing nice evocations for you throughout okay um so that's pretty cool next up we have the koya which again slow to recruit costs more does not have good combat stats like the inca does uh and does not have a whole host of special abilities what they get instead is more magic paths right so instead of having the four paths that the inca has the Koya has six paths, and then they're H2 instead of H3, right? So Earth 2, Astral 2, Death 2 um, is pretty good. Ooh, um, actually something I wanted to mention about the Incas. So you're very excited to get um, fire, uh, a fire random or an air random. You're honestly typically not excited to get a Astral random, because this means that they get magic dueled very, very easily, generally speaking. Um, so this can be somewhat of a liability, and we'll talk more about why later on. Uh, but yeah, that can be a bit of a pain in the ass. It, it is useful somewhat, um, but you got to be careful when you get those types of things. Koya, uh, Earth 2, Astral 2, Death 2, with a 30% random. So this is pretty interesting to get Fire, Air, Earth, Astral, Death. Um, so you are generally happy to get all of these for reasons that we'll discuss later. Um, but you're happiest to get Earth Astral Death because Earth Astral Death is going to give you higher path access and that tends to be more useful than the splash of whatever else you're going to get, right? Um, Koyas are super, super useful. Um, Earth Astral, it gives you access to the crystal um, path so you can make all of the crystal gear. Um, that's very awesome. Uh, death and Earth gives you access to a couple of weird little things. Doesn't really matter as much. Uh, but Death and Earth are both super useful paths on their own. Um, getting these 30% randoms can get you relatively higher into uh, your depth access, your, your path access. Um, 
And then Koyas are just easy astral communions um, for masters generally. You don't typically want to use them as slaves. So, um, good, good mages. The problem, or maybe not the problem, downside to both Incas and Koyas is the Royal Malqui. Much like the Huron Priest and the Akla, when an Inca or a Koya die, they turn into the Royal Malqui. With a caveat. When an Inca dies, his spouse sacrifices herself to be mummified together with him in a mummy bundle. The mummy is then brought to the tombs of the sun and given proper dues and blah, 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 blah. If the Inca doesn't have a spouse, a young and untrained virgin of the sun will sacrifice herself instead. And the Koya, when a Koya dies, her spouse sacrifices, yada, yada, yada. So, when an Inca dies, if you also have a Koya, that Koya, the, the game will just look for a Koya, and it will kill that Koya, and they will both turn into a royal Malqui, a single royal Malqui, right? Same thing with the Koya. If a Koya dies, it, the game will look for an Inca, it will kill that Inca, and it will turn them into a combined royal Malqui. If you lose one of these and you do not have the opposite, right? If you lose an Inca and you don't have a Koya to match, it will still turn into a royal Malqui, but it will be a lesser version of a royal Malqui, and you do not want that. This is an incredibly interesting mechanic, but it can also be an incredibly detrimental mechanic. Randomly losing a Koya or an Inca that was supposed to be doing something important for you, like leading an army or casting a big spell in an upcoming battle or, or what have you, can be catastrophically detrimental, right? So this is a super unique, super interesting mechanic, but it can also bite you in the ass. And players, good players, know to try to exploit it, right? If they see an army... Um, moving around, and they they know, hey, I need to try to pop that Koya or that Inca. That's going to cause problems for the Nazca player, etc., etc. Um, so, really super, super interesting mechanic, but it can bite you in the ass. What do you get out of it? You get the Royal Malqui, which is one of the best mages in the game. <laughs> so... Um, you get a Royal Malqui by having an Inca die, whether they have access to a Koya or not, or a Koya die, whether they have access to an Inca or not. Preferably, you want to have both of them so that when one dies, the other can die and you get a full Royal Malqui. Um, alternatively, if you have the, the gold for it, you can just buy a Royal Malqui for 850 gold. This is one of it this is one of the most expensive mages in the game. I don't think it is the most expensive mage in the game, but it might be. And there's a reason for it. It's it's got a lot going on. So the Royal Malqui out of the gate, if you just buy one, the by the way, the, the upkeep cost for these things is 340 gold. That's no fucking joke. Even as sacreds, that is insanely high. Okay, so keep that in mind, right? What you get for this cost is out of the box, Fire 2, Air 2, Earth 2, Astral 2, Death 2, H3, with a 10% random for any of those. Um, that is very strong. It's also relatively shallow, right? Um, it's not so shallow that it's unuseful, but it is, a, it can be a little difficult to manage to get to high options, right? To high, to high air, for example, right? It can be difficult. You'll have to go through things like storm power, um, uh, storm into um, potentially boosters or things like that for higher air access. Um, same thing for uh, earth, right? And fire. Although they have a little bit of an easier time. Um, you can't put boots 
on these things. You can't put like a winged helmet on them. They only use crowns and laurels, right? Um, so it is actually relatively difficult to get these things boosted up. Typically, the way that you can boost them up is uh, storm, storm, storm power, summon earth power, phoenix power, um, power of the spheres, uh, and that's that tends to be the way that you go. If an Inca and a Koya die to form a royal Malqui, instead of you just buying one, the Inca and Koya that die combine their current um, paths to generate the new royal Malqui's paths. So, if your Koya randomed Earth 3 and your Inca randomed Fire 3, you will have a Fire 3, Earth 3, 2s and everything else, Royal Malqui. And that is very powerful. Any, any of these boosted, right? Getting a Fire 3, Air 3, any of these in 3 is, is quite a big boon, right? Um, because it is that much easier for the Royal Malqui to get further up where they want to be. Um, that is very, 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 very powerful. So it does tend to be more beneficial um, rolling the dice to try to get Koyas, um, which have a 30% random, um, to to combine into a improved Royal Malqui. But the downside is this, right? A Royal Malqui can be recruited every turn. Incas and Koyas are slow to recruit cap onlys. So it takes four turns to get an Inca and Koya, whereas you could just have four Royal Malquis at that point if you can afford it. But the problem is, is can you fucking afford it, right? So incredibly expensive mage, but incredibly interesting mage with incredibly diverse paths. Everything else is mostly the same. Slightly better fortune teller. Slightly better reanimation bonus. The big deal and what sets Royal Malquis apart from almost everything else in the game is this. Innate Spellcaster 2. Innate Spellcaster on its own would already be powerful on the Royal Malqui because they have diverse enough paths um, to be powerful and interesting casters. But Innate Spellcaster 2 is something else entirely because it allows them to cast two spells every turn regardless of what the spell is. And that is phenomenally strong. This is where people go, yeah, um, Nazca's overpowered, uh, you should not let them in the game, innate spellcasters are bullshit. And they're not wrong. The people that say that aren't wrong. Innate spellcaster is extremely powerful. But look at what it takes to get this unit. And keep in mind that this is not some titan chassis. This is not some unkillable god king, right? You're paying 150 gold and 340 gold a year to get this unit. Or you're paying four cap turns plus, what, 600 gold to get this unit. And... It is a very killable unit. You can magic duel this easily, right? Um, you can, I think you can magic duel undead things, right? You can magic duel undead things. Not speaking out of my ass. Magic duel! Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah. You, you magic duel. 
Unless unless there is something not on this tag that I'm not looking at um, correctly. So you can magic duel these guys very easily. Um, you can kill them with a single hit of any strong weapon. Um, you can kill them with any of the undead killing mechanics, ravenous swarm, etc., uh, etc. Et right? Like these guys are very killable. Um, so they are extremely powerful, right? They are very, very strong. But the pro the pros that they have, very good path access um, and a crazy ability in innate spellcaster is offset by the fact that they are incredibly expensive and, and thus relatively difficult to come by, right? Um, they are fragile, right? And they can be difficult to use because, again, they will burn through a communion like a hot knife through butter, right? Um, and I think that's awesome. I know other people in, in the community think that they are toxic. I think it's amazing because it's such a unique unit and it's so uniquely weighted, right? Um, it has great strengths but against a skilled player it, it's not a hammer that you can just fling around and expect to crush everything um if you use a royal malqui improperly you're just killing a royal malqui that's it right like you will just absolutely piss away 850 gold or four cap turns right um but if you use it right and you counter your opponents rather than be countered, it can be an incredibly effective, incredibly interesting mage. Um, so I'm, I think they're really neat. I know a lot of people hate them um, and think that they make Nazca overpowered. I don't think they make, make Nazca overpowered. I think they give Nazca a unique opportunity and kind of a, a win condition, right? If you are able to get to the late game and afford several Royal Malquis, right? Like, if you're able to get to the late game and you have 20 Royal Malquis running around, you maybe kind of deserve to win at that point, right? If no one has been picking off your Royal Malquis, no one has been punishing you for them, then, yeah, you probably kind of deserve to win. Good players, though, are going to do that. Good players are going to, every time they see a Royal Malkwe in the field, they're going to be like, hmm, what can I do to put that son of a bitch in the ground? Or son and daughter of a bitch, right? <laughs> I think it's so unique that, that they take two individuals and that's why it has innate spellcaster too because it's 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 very much like the salon mage priest of warhammer fantasy where they're being like carried around on the palaquins and and these guys are just out here going boom boom but now you've got two of them up there so they're going boom 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 and it's really awesome um i i i think this is one of the coolest units in the game um it's just really neat it's also i think um looks neat compared to a lot of stuff in Dominions. So, that's me gushing about the Royal Malquis. Uh, they're very special units. Um, they're very polarizing units in the community. Um, let's move on to the last two units for Nazca, and then we'll talk about some of the other stuff, uh, other mechanics in the in the nation. Uh, so, last two things we have are the Paco of the Earth Mother and the Paco of the Mountain Spirits. These are your only human mages. Uh, they can be recruited in all mountains and highlands, regardless of whether or not you have a fort. You just need a lab. Um, and they are your only real nature access. So you get an earth nature and you get an air nature. These cross paths are not especially useful. Um, but the fact that they are your only inherent air nature mages can be very, very useful. They are both inept researchers. So you're typically not going to want a lot of them. They're also both heretics, right? Which can be a bit of a pain in the ass, depending on what you're trying to do, okay? Um, they are both fortune tellers, which can be... Oh, sorry. Just the, the Earth Mother is a fortune teller. So that can be useful. They are both disease healers, which is pretty useful. 
Um, and then the Earth Mother is a fortune teller. The Mountain Spirit is a bringer of fortune. So kind of have some interesting things that you can do with them. For the most part, these are just going to be early Earth, early nature access. Um, unless you get some indie uh, uh, commanders or something like that that you're going to utilize instead. Um, otherwise, these are not incredibly useful unless you have a niche concept that you're going for. I've seen some people be like, oh, I can use Bringer of Fortune to do some crazy stuff. Um, the problem with crazy stuff with Bringer of Fortune is it's their heretics. So it can be very difficult to combine with something like Lux Scales because you can heretic your luck scales away uh and then you're not really benefiting from your bringer of fortune right so it can be i mean you're still you still are right it's still gonna work it just might not work as good as it otherwise would right uh, but they're still interesting units nonetheless they're just not phenomenal units comparatively to some of the other stuff that you get you're gonna want a couple probably to get you some nature access and then you move on so those are the base units and commanders. Let's look at the sites real quick. We have the Palace of the Sun Kings and we have the Tomb of the Sun Kings. Um, these give you access to your specials, your Inca Koya Sun Guard, and then your Royal Malqui Condor Warriors. Um, so very, very important. You also get Fire, Air, Astral, Earth, Death. Um, just like you have access to magic, you get one of each. This is a little unfortunate. Like, it does make sense for the nation because they do have this wonderful spread of magic, but it also means that they get access to fewer specific gems that they would want. Specifically, they would really want more air, death, or astral um, than they would fire or earth, generally speaking. So that can be somewhat unfortunate, but it, it's just how the nation is. So, um... Let us jump into, actually, um, on the subject of commanders, let's talk about heroes. Um, so, Nazca has some very interesting, unique heroes. They do not have any multi-heroes. Uh, this tournament is using the, isn't it? Yes, this tournament is using worthy heroes. Um, so... We're going to talk about all of those. The uh, base game has these two, uh, Keshvar and Monko Oklo, as uh, unique heroes in the game. And then Worthy Heroes adds Pacha Cutie and Mama Pacha. Um, all of these are interesting mages for some reason or another. So, first up we have Keshvar. Keshvar is actually an interesting lore um, hero because Keshvar is from Kalia or Kalem right um so keshvar finds nazca and is like oh shit i i found this hidden i isolated kingdom that still practices necromancy right because calum had this whole civil war over necromancy um but keshvar actually see find, when he finds nazca he finds that their society is operating better than the kalian society um, and he, he thinks it's a better place. So he actually works with Nazca to keep their secret and, and help them, basically. Um, so it's a very interesting kind of lore mechanic. This is a powerful mage. Um, fire 1, Air 3, Water 2, Astral 2. Um, so the Air 3 can be very useful to you. Um, but really, the biggest thing is, is that this guy is water too, and you do not have normal access to water in Nazca. So this guy can break you into that if you don't get lucky with any of um, your indie commanders or indie mages, or if you don't have access on your pretender or something like that, right? Um, so this guy isn't super mega awesome crazy, but can be very useful for high air and water access. So um, minimum turn five for arrival, not bad. Um, we're going to save the first couple because they're kind of like the big, big head honchos. Um, Pacha Cutie is a crazy interesting uh, hero. He's basically an amped up Inca. He is the Inca, he who shakes the earth, um, the supreme Nazcan emperor. So really, really cool. Very strong. Um, has better gear than a base Inca with the Armor of the Sun, which gives him um, all three. So, very cool. 
He still mummifies into a royal Malqui if he dies, so you still have that going on for him. And unlike the base Incas, he actually has Earth 3 as well as Fire and Air. So um, that's really strong. You can do some really awesome stuff with that. But the big thing about him is, is that he starts every battle with a size 6 Earth Elemental and 5 size 1 Earth Elementals. And every turn, he generates a new size 1 Earth Elemental. So this guy can do some crazy things on his own, right? Because a size 6 Earth Elemental and 5 size 1s and then another size 1 every single um, turn is easily enough to take on almost any PD. Um, any normal PD. You can take on almost probably like 20 PD or more um, with that type of generation. Um, and then he also just has pretty decent combat stats and nice enough protection that he can do some pretty decent thugging on his own, especially with Earth, Air, and Fire, which are all very good thug um, paths. So really, really interesting there. Um, one of the bad things about him is, is that he does still have low morale, only 14 morale. Um, so he will break from combat relatively easily, but he is a flyer, so he can get out of the way pretty well. He's also a phenomenal leader, so if you get Pachacuti, he can do a lot of different things for you. Um, he's awesome. Uh, very, very cool. Very, very unique hero. Next up, we have the Wingless Koya, Mama Pacha. Um, this is an interesting another lore scenario. Uh, she is a Wingless Koya. Uh, she was born wingless, which is seen as a sign of disfavor from the gods. Um, so typically, that would not be a good thing. She would be cast out, or she would be ignored, etc., etc. But Mama Pacha would be like, no, 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 fuck you. I am the voice of the earth. Um, you're going to fucking listen to me, right? So Mama Pacha does what Mama Pacha wants. And she's kind of interesting. She's got Earth 3, Nature 3. The nature three can be very important to you. Um, so she can she can break you into actually good nature, um, which is pretty awesome. Uh, she has built-in reinvigoration. She's a fortune teller. Um, and the big thing with her is, is that she has healer too. Not disease healer, but healer too. So she can actually be very, very useful in doing some things with, um, with healing your units um, and some other niche kind of uh, situations. So... Really cool lore, uh, lore hero, has some pretty interesting uses, um, and does not have a turn timer. You can get her right out of the gate. Um, Pachacuti ha uh, also does not have a turn timer. You can get him basically right out of the gate. Um, unlike the Keshvar um, or the final hero, which is the first couple. The first couple is uh, the first, in theory, uh, Royal Malqui. And they are phenomenal. Uh, they, they are what a Royal Malqui is, but basically better across the board. Um, they have Death 4, uh, 2s and everything else, but they are also H4. I believe... It's been a long time since I've done something like this, but I believe you can take an H4 and prophetize them, and that will make them an H5, which I think is the only way to get most H5s. Having an H5 can be very unique um, and very cool. This hero has a minimum turn arrival of 20, so you cannot get them very early in the game. Um, they have amped up stats compared to other Royal Malquis, better HP, better protections... Well, not better protections, but better, like, magic resistance, which is protection for a Royal Malqui, really. Uh, better reanimations, uh, etc. But the the big, 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 big thing is, is that they have Innate Spellcaster 3. So they cast three fucking spells per turn, which is insane. Um, really, 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 really cool. Um, and, I yeah, it's just fucking awesome. Uh, so, so that's a really, really neat scenario. They also have some very, very cool lore. Um, so, uh, very, very neat. Um, so, yeah, anyways. Uh, that, those are the heroes. No multi-heroes or anything like that. But the heroes, the unique heroes that you can get for Nazca are pretty powerful. 
and they can be very, very useful in the right situations, breaking you into better access or just giving you super powerful um, individuals to use. Although again, right, none of these individuals are like crazy giant level individuals that are unkillable super combatants. You can very, very much kill the first couple or patch a cutie or, or any of the rest of these, like they are very killable, so you have to be very careful in how you use them. Um, anyways, moving on. Those are the heroes. We're gonna jump into a game that I pulled up, or a test game that I created um, for Nazca, so that we can see all of the other units and talk about some specific mechanics, okay? All right, so Nazca has the ability to um, reanimate, right? Um, and they have some summonable uh, sacreds, and then they have some other spells, some other unique spells, and they have a single item. So we're going to go over all of those now. We're going to start by discussing the ability to reanimate. So first off, right, um, any reanimator priest, whether it is the um, Malqui Priestess, the Malqui Priest, or the Royal Malqui, all three of those, you have to be a priest, right? Have the reanimator option. Anything that is H3, anything that is H3 with reanimator can also reanimate or call Supayas, which is going to be really big. We'll talk about that more when we actually talk about Supayas, okay? Um, but for now, right, these reanimators, um, anything below H3, do ghouls, soulless, and long dead based off of their reanimation bonus, right? So um, priestesses being one, priests being two, royal Malquis being three, okay? So um, you can reanimate ghouls, you can reanimate soulless, and you can reanimate long dead warriors. What do you get for each of these? Well, the ghouls are exactly what you get through regular ghoul summoning, right? They are identical. Nothing is different about them in any shape, way, shape, form, or fashion. And just like regular ghouls, right, um, you will lose 10 population per ghoul that you reanimate. So if you reanimate 11 ghouls, you're losing 110 population. So ghouls are typically not super useful and they're not something that you want to do because you're going to lose population. These are not very, you're not going to see very many of these with, with Nazca, right? You don't really have a big reason to do them with Nazca. Next up, you have Solus, right? Solus, you can make way more of, but Solus require unburied corpses. If you have no un unburied corpses in the province, you can't use them right or you can't you can't get them so that can be a little difficult to actually do most nations that make use of soulless with reanimator priests have death um scales so they're generating corpses automatically because their population is dying but nazca is generally not going to want to do that that will be very painful for them they have very high upkeep costs so soulless are somewhat difficult for you to manage one tactic that you can use is with the Hatan Runa. So if you create a Hatan Runa um, like location, you can generate a whole lot of Hatan Runa that will just get diseased and die and create an ongoing supply of corpses for you to utilize. The problem with that is, is that even while the Hatan Runa are slaves and they're very cheap, Having that many Hatan Runa is still very expensive. Um, it, it will still cost you a pretty penny to, to deal with that kind of scenario. Um, when you start to get Hatan Runa in the thousands, right? Um, you're still going to be putting a damper on your income. And even in that scenario, it can be a weird situation to profit from, right? Because... That's a lot to put into and a lot to, to have to deal with just to generate corpses, right? So what can you actually get out of those corpses? Well, you can get soulless out of those corpses. You can get regular soulless, which are regular soulless and not great, 
Um, better hit points than a a long dead, but worse stats, mindless, undisciplined. These things are not very good, right? The people that, or the nations that tend to use Solus, use Solus because they can get Solus very easily. You, as Nazca, can't get Solus very easily, and so there's not really a whole purpose for you to use Solus, unless your unique version is better. It's not. <laughs> This is the Nazcan Solus, which is basically a a Solus bird, but it's it's undead, so it can't fly, and it's actually worse in basically every way than the regular Solus. It has less HP, it's size 3, so it has lower attack dis density, it's just altogether worse. So even if you wanted to generate this Solus factory, you actually get worse Solus out of it, than any other nation. <laughs> so it's really not super useful for you to do. It would be more useful for you to do something, set something up like this and turn it into a um, a, a crow factory, right? Where you're, you're eating the corpses for uh, death gems, right? It would be more useful to do that than it would be to generate the soulless, right? Um, so anyways. That is kind of unfortunate, and that brings us to the last reanimation that you have, which is the reanimate long dead warriors. So, like, like you did with Solus, you have unique versions of the long dead warriors. You have access to all of the regular ones, right? Um, uh, sword with some minor uh, protection. Um, spear with no protection, sword with no protection, I think, is one of the options. I don't know. Looks like we just have sword with protection and... S Whoa, sword with protection, spear with protection, and spear without protection is what we, we kind of see here. So, I think there are other versions, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, either way... They're long dead, right? Um, long dead are useful. They they don't have the greatest stats, but they have significantly better stats than um, Solus do. They're undead, so you can use them in like rigor mortis plays or things like that. Um, they will take a buff. They will go underwater. They're they're good, right? If you can generate large amounts of long dead, that can be very useful. Um, Nazga has their own variants. They have two variants. Ah, there's my sword users, my my swords without anything. Um, Nazca has access to a mace variant and a spear variant. Um, unlike the soulless versions, these are size 2 still, rather than size 3, because all of the flesh has rotted off the wings, um, so the wings are no, no longer taking up additional space. Um, these are... Uh, wholly ununique. There's nothing special about them other than the fact that they have a better, uh, not a better, a different model. In point of fact, none of them wear armor, and armor, the armored versions are the best versions of the Solus. So, again, you actually have inherently worse long dead as Nazca than basically almost anyone else. So that's kind of a bummer, but at the end of the day, long dead, even Nazcan long dead are still useful. They're just not as good, right? So that is, um, that's the, the undead chaff that you can generate via your reanimation. Um, so that's interesting. Let's talk about our uh, summons at this point, right? So in Conjuration, we have at level three, we have summon condors. Um, at level 5, we have Summon Huakas and Summon Supayas. Uh, both of, or all three of these ca require a level 2 mage, right? So Air 2, um, Astral 2, Death 2. Um, and they all co cost a decent amount of gems. We'll start with Summon Condors because Summon Condors is kind of like the quintessential thing. Um, I have Condors, Supayas, and Huakas here. I also have Sun Guard and uh, Condor Warriors here, so we have comparisons via what we can recruit with what we can summon. So, Condors being the first thing, um, and this is gonna, we're gonna talk more about this because it's much like the Hatan Runa. Uh, Condors are one of those things that defined Nazcan power at the beginning of Dominions 5 and made people. Um, 
made people believe, rightly so, that Nazca was overpowered. Uh, and just like the Hatan Runa, no longer operate in an identical fashion to what they used to, and thus have made Nazca somewhat weaker, but with the same reputation that it used to have. Um, I am, again, once again, I'm working off a of memory here, so if I'm incorrect, let me know down in the comments, but I believe this is how it is. Summon Condors now has a 9 gem cost for 10 Condors, plus 1 for every extra level of the caster. It used to have 7 gem cost for 10 plus plus, meaning it was 2 for every extra level of the caster. In ye olden days, it was very common for someone to make an Awake Pretender that had Air 7 or more, right? So that they could get 20 Condors for 7 Air Gems. And that is absurd. That is incredibly powerful. But now, if you were to do that exact same thing, you would get 15 Condors for 9 Gems which is much more reasonable, right? Um, so let's take a look at what we're actually getting for doing summon condors. This is a condor. It actually has a pip, so let me grab... Um, ta -ta -ta -ta. Yeah, this, these condors do not have pips. We'll throw them up here. So this is a condor base stats across the board. You have HP 18, which is pretty good. You have size 3, which is comparable to all your other flyers. You have two attacks, which means you're going to have better attack density on your condors. That's good. Um, you have decent stats, nothing special. Um, okay strength, okay attack, not good defense. No protection to really to speak of because these things are animals. They don't wear armor. Oh, right. They're animals. They are animals, meaning they have abysmal magic resistance. Um, and they can be affected by all the animal spells. So that can be very important to remember, right? They inherently have shock resistance, sacred, obviously. They are absurdly stealthy, 140 stealth. I think they are one of, if not the stealthiest unit in the game. Um, they have a siege bonus, which is nice. That puts them up to 3.9 siege strength. They can crack forts very easily. And they have a crazy patrol bonus of 20. So these things are one of the best, best patrollers in the game. Uh, very, very cool. They have map move 32, which is absurdly high. So you can get a lot of condors for a fair amount of air gems. You get less or more than you used to. Um, you used to get a crazy amount of condors for a paltry amount of air gems. Um, but, and people, people, you know, they, they quibble over the concept of like seven versus nine air gems. But really, when you think about it, right? If you're building to try to get condors out as soon as, fa as possible, you are designing a bless that the condors can take, right? You're designing a pretender that is going to be awake to research you up to those condors and to be able to cast condors when you get them. Um, having that cost nine gems instead of seven gems when you're only generating one gem per turn means if you have no other outside income, the earliest you can cast this is turn 9 versus turn, well, turn 10 versus turn 7, right? Or, or turn 8. Um, so, right? I think that's right. I think you don't get a, do you get a gem the first turn? I think you get a gem the first turn. So you, sh you should be able to do 7 and 9. So ignore that. Um, so if you can get to that, if you can get to Conjuration 3, with an Awake Pretender, which you should be able to by that point, right? And you don't have the ability to get any outside gems. It takes you that much longer to get to them. Or you have to alchemize gems, which is inefficient. And when you finally do it, you're getting less Condors than you otherwise would. And getting a critical mass, as we've talked about earlier, with the fact that you're... you're 
um, sacreds are kind of squishy is really important, right? These things have no protection um, or almost no protection. They have basically no defense. They're going to get hit. When they get hit, they're going to take that damage and they don't have a crazy amount of HP to survive the damage. They are relying on the drop. They are relying on there being more of them and when they come down, they kill everything that they come down on, right? If you get less of them for every cast and every cast costs more, that is a significant nerf because that means you are, you are taking longer to get to that critical mass and that critical mass is costing you more, okay? So condors are really, really interesting um, but they have some really inherent weaknesses. One of the other inherent weaknesses that they have is, is that they are animals. They have no gear. They have no weapons. They have length zero attacks, right, that do not have a damage modifier. So if you look at their attack density, it's better than the other sacreds of Nazca. But their attack, their damage output is actually not good. Right? 18 versus 12, 14, but with a charge bonus. Right? Um, if we go up to the Sapayas, 13, but with a charge. Actually, maybe they don't have a charge bonus. Yeah. Um, 17, but with a charge bonus. Right? So the Condors have better attack density, but they do lower damage. And that can be a very big problem. So, super cool unit very strong very powerful in the right situations but they not they are not again that swiss army knife that oh once you get to condors you can just pop out condors for every turn for the rest of forever and they're just unbeatable not the case that kind of used to be the case right because they were cheaper and you got more of them and that was really hard to handle but where they're at now is is kind of manageable especially when paired with the fact that you don't have that free kind of concept with Hatan Runa. So, very, very interesting um, summonable unit. Next up, we have the Huaka and the Supaya, which are both at uh, Conjuration 5. The Huakas are actually kind of the living versions of the Supayas. Uh, they're semi-divine um, uh, originators of the Nazkins, right? Um, and then the Supayas are their, their ghostly versions. Um, you don't get Supayas when your Huakas die. That would be really cool, but that would probably kind of bust it. Um, Huakas are Astral 2, Supayas are Death 2. Huakas cost 15 Astral, Supayas cost 10 Death. So, you get 5 Huakas for 15 Astral, you get 5 Supayas for 10 Death. That means the Huakas come at quite a premium. 3 Astral per Huaka is kind of a lot. Um, though this is relatively mage turn efficient. What are you getting out of your three astral gems? You're getting a pretty good unit, right? Um, again, this is not an end-all be-all unit that is going to beat every other sacred in the game or anything like that, but it is a pretty powerful unit, especially when it has a good bless. It has 16 HP, which is very good for what you typically field. It has pretty decent stats, 12, 13, 14, um, and it has 15 protection, which is basically the best that you have access to. That's because it has this fire plate, um, and that's really awesome. So, 15 protection with zero natural protection means these things take protection buffs very, very well. And because it has fire plate, it inherently has fire resistance, so if you throw up mass protection, these guys actually don't, um, they don't, there's not the deficit, there's not the downside as badly as there is for most other people, right? Um, so that's very, very nice for them. Um, they have pretty decent magic resistance and better morale than most of your other units do. These guys are pretty strong stat-wise. Sacred, obviously. They have Awe 2, which when layered with the fact that they have good protection, good-ish defense, okay HP... That gives them multiple layers of defense. So these guys are way more survivable than a lot of your other sacreds are. 
Built-in shock resistance 10, built-in fire resistance 10, built-in cold, cold resistance 10. That's very nice. That means when you are in the late game and you throw big battlefield-wide resistance buffs, these guys are going to be 15, 10, 10 at the least. Um, or if you're doing something like Army of Lead or, or, or Gold, right? Particularly Army of Lead, um, the shock resistance isn't going to hurt them as badly and they're going to remain shock 10 fire 10 um cold 10 when when they have the other bonuses as well right so that can be very very powerful because it means most battlefield evocations aren't going to really matter to them very much one potential downside is is that they are magic beings so they can be targeted with magic being specific spells and you don't have a whole lot of magic being um leadership so that can be somewhat tricky to to deal with the other big thing is is that they are storm immune which we should have pointed out condors are not storm immune so um if you run up against people who are putting up storm condors can get fucked by storm um so huakas are storm immune that's very very powerful they also have this magic lance which has a uh, pretty decent amount of damage on it um very high attack value right so it has a plus two attack bonus um, and it has a charge bonus, right? So uh, these guys sitting at um, 12 strength, if you put strength of giants on them, they're up to 16. If you have a plus four strength on your bless, that's up to 20, right? Um, so these guys will hit, it's 21, 25 for base. So 25 for base, 35 on the lance charge. Um, and that can make people blink, right? That can be a very, very big deal, especially if it's coupled with uh, increased attack value so they have a better chance of hitting or some sort of weapon bless or something like that, right? That can be a really big deal. Hawakas are very strong. Um, they are a little slower map move compared to some of your other options because of all of the gear that they're utilizing, but Hawakas cost the most out of any of your sacreds for a reason just because they're the best sacred that you have um these are pretty pretty cool i like them a lot the supaya is the dead version and they are stat wise inferior to the huakas uh in almost every way except they have slightly better defense right um they are undead so ha they have all the things that generally come with undead meaning uh they have poison resistance um and they can go underwater. Not all undead can, but supayas can. Um, they're also ghosts, so they're ethereal. So that can be very powerful in and of itself. If your opponent does not have access to a lot of evocations or magic weapons, then supayas can be somewhat oppressive. Um, they're also storm immune, so that's pretty strong. Uh, they do have a spectral spear which allows for a magic resistance check for half damage. So this can be somewhat of a bummer because they might not deal all of the damage that they should all of the time. Um, but that's okay. You're not really using them because they're super duper killy. You're using them because you can mass them as ghosts and they're ethereal. The other really big thing about Supayas is, is that these motherfuckers fly underwater. <laughs> um, which I don't know if they're the only thing in the game that does that, but they are one of the only things in the game that does that. Um, and that can be very oppressive. Meaning, you're already a nation who can get underwater via undead, which is nice. When you add in Supayas who can fly underwater, and the fact that you can't put Storm up underwater... That can make things, oh, and these, they're storm immune even if you could, right? That can make it very difficult for underwater nations to fight effectively against you. Underwater nations tend to fight in very specific ways because they're underwater. Land nations fight in other ways. They have different tools than underwater nations have access to. A lot of those tools are useful against you as a flying nation, and a lot of those tools are aren't accessible to underwater nations so nazca is actually one of the nations in the game that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an underwater nation 
in the right circumstances. It's not just like a freebie given scenario, but if they're allowed to come online and they're allowed to produce a lot of supayas um, and get their undead economy kind of going, then they can give underwater nations a run for their money. And that can be very important. Okay, so supayas are super interesting. You get you get more, you get the same amount of supayas for less, right? So you get five supayas, but for two gems per. So it can be cheaper to mass supayas. And supayas are really useful in certain situations, right? Um, huakas tend to be better overall. But again, they're, they're different tools for different jobs. Huakas tend to have better stats and are going to generally be better in big land battles where they're going to get a whole lot of different buffs, etc., etc. Supayas tend to be better for surgical situations or if you just have massed a crazy amount of them or if you're going underwater. Um, so let's talk about that ability to mass some things. Uh, Nazca has a very special item that they can create. And I wish, this is random uh, aside, I wish more, more nations had uh, national items that they could make. National items are really, really cool. Put in more national items. That, that would be freaking awesome. Like, um, every nation should have one to three national items that they sh can make. It gives so much flavor and it's so interesting. Even if the item does... The same exact thing as a different item does, but just with different paths or cheaper access or something like that, it can still be very, very cool. Anyways, the uh, the nation of Nazca can make the Huaka headdress. It is a crown item, and that is important to remember because all of your Malquis can only wear crowns. They can't wear helmets, right? Crowns are loyals, lo loyals, laurels. Um, so this can be a useful piece. It gives Inspirational plus 1, Command 25, uh, Magic Command 10, and Undead Command 10, which is uh, nice, but honestly, that's all kind of whatever, right? Like, you don't really care about that, generally speaking. Um, it's nice, but it's not the craziest thing in existence. Uh, and the armor on it is not especially good. What is really important about this is down here in the text, right? The divine glow of the headdress will make Huakas and their Supaya ghosts arrive in greater numbers and allow royal Malquis to animate additional Supayas. One extra per month for holy reanimation or two extra for magic rituals. So, let's talk about <coughs> the, the thing that we, we skipped over earlier. Um, any H3, I mentioned this earlier, any H3 reanimator for Nazca can, when reanimating, they can call Supayas. So they can call two Supayas per turn. If they are H4, they will call three Supayas. If they are H5, they will call four Supayas. <coughs> if they are wearing a Huaka headdress, they will reanimate one additional. So at three, they'll do three. At four, they'll do four. At five, they'll do five. Um, I'm not sure you would want to be doing um, <laughs> five, but it, it's a thing. Um, anyways, let's actually do this real quick because I did not think about testing this. We're going to pull out a Malkwe Priestess real quick. Because I mentioned earlier, right, any H3 can call Supayas. It doesn't have to be a Royal Malkwe. So... Oh, I don't have... Do I ha Do I already have a... <coughs> I don't know if I already profitize... Well, I, obviously, I, I wish there was a way to track your profit. Um... Hmm... <laughs> I, okay, here's my profit, right? So this guy is an H4, so he can, um, by reanimating, because he's an H4, he would reanimate three, because he's wearing the Huwaka headdress, he reanimates four. Um, so what I was going to show off is, is that one technique that you can actually use is very early on in the game, if you want to get Supayas, because, 
it if you're if you have a royal Malqui early on in the game, just getting two Supayas per turn, that's a very expensive 340 gold per year way to get Supayas. That is not normally worth it. But if you get a a um Malqui Priestess, right, 175 gold, or you get an Akla and get her killed and turned into a Malqui Priestess, that is a Reanimator Priest. You can profitize that Malqui Priestess, and they will be H3, meaning they will be able to call Supayas. So on turn 2 or 3 or 4 or something like that relatively early in the game, you can have a Malqui Priestess that is calling Supayas, and if you get into your first war around, like, turn 13, 14, 15, something like that, you might have amassed at that point 20 Supayas that can take your Bless, that can be ethereal, that can be a really big boon to a first war that you have. So that can be a very interesting technique. I don't know if the Huwaka headdresses work with the, um, with the Malqui Priestesses or not. I think that they might have to be worn by a Royal Malqui. I guess I can just see. Can we put this on? I, we can put it on. I don't know if it will actually reanimate though. So that's something that I was going to try to test there. But we already have a... Uh, we have a Prophet. And I don't want to go get the Prophet killed and then wait that many turns. So that's something that I'm not 100% sure on. Um, aside from that though. If you are wearing a Huwaka headdress. And you cast Summon Huwakas or Summon Supayas. You don't get one more you get two more. And that is one, that's a way to generate a lot of Supayas very quickly because you're getting seven for 10 death gems. And that is a way to be more efficient for summoning Huwakas, right? Because then you're getting seven for 15 and that's not as bad as five for 15, right? Um, so at a price of uh, 10 fire gems, which is not bad at all, and the fact that this is a construction four, it's very, very nice to try to get some Huaka headdresses going. Um, if you are going to be generating Huakas and Supayas, which you should be if you're playing Nazca, right? Then, then you probably want Huaka headdresses for every individual that is going to be generating those um, those units. Okay, uh, Huaka headdresses, very, very cool, very thematic. Uh, very fun national item uh, use. It. All right, uh, last thing to talk about in uh, spells is the fact that in enchantment, uh, Nazca has two spells, Eyes of the Condor and Geoglyphs. Eyes of the Condor is an interesting spell. It is basically just the scrying um, option. Uh, it costs two air and or it, two air to cast and one air gem to cast plus an air gem for every turn that you're using it for. For four provinces, which is nice because four provinces is typically the space that you need to get to someone's capital. So I've used this on the AI Arcosophale up here. And, you know, you get you get the very specific um, uh, uh, scrying information that you normally would, right? So you get exact amount of enemy units. You get a good representation of the enemy units. You get the strongest commander. You get local defense information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this is not the most useful thing for Nazca in the world, especially since your air gems come at a very big premium. But it is useful enough to use on the occasion, right? Um, if you need to know what's going on in a province and you are far away from that province, you can figure it out. It's it's doable. Um, I find most often that you don't want to dump a lot of air gems into this, right? But you could if you really need to, like, keep eyes on a throne or a capital or, or a specific, like, location, like a choke point or something like that, um, and you don't have any scouts, you could just scry that location or eyes of the condor that location um, for a couple turns and go from there, right? So can be very useful in the right circumstances. Pretty neat. Last thing that you have is Geoglyphs. This thing is Enchantment 5, which is not bad because you normally want to go Enchantment 5 for Hordes of Skeleton anyways. Um, but it is relatively difficult to cast. This is an Astral 3 Earth to 18 Astral Gems spell. Um, so this is only really castable by your Koyas or your Pretender. Actually, I think it has to be cast by a Koya, 
right? Um, I think so. Yeah, you have to be flying, so you can't cast this from a Royal Malqui. Um, so yeah. So what does this do? This is, uh, this is very thematic. This is representative of the actual geoglyphs of real-life Nazca, right? Uh, this boosts magic scales by two, which is neat, right? It reduces the MR for enemies in a province by two, also neat, um, and it increases ritual range by one, which could be very, very strong. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, except it's not really awesome because it can only be cast in wastelands, which is kind of trash, right? So we have an example out here. Um, we have these geoglyphs. Um, the problem with only being able to cast it, I get it from a lore, from like a historical per perspective, right? Like the geoglyphs are etched into what is basically a wasteland, right? Um, but in a game mechanic standpoint, it's very difficult to make use of this. There are, there tend to be very few wastelands in the in any given game, right? So you might not even have access to a wasteland to be able to use this in. And then when you do put this in there, the reason why you would want to put it in a wasteland is to take advantage of something like the magic scales boost, meaning that you could potentially um, like take neutral scales or take drain and then compensate by using geoglyphs, right? The problem with that is, is in... Again, you might not have access to a wasteland, and if you have access to a wasteland, it might be in a shit spot to lab or fort, right? Labbing and forting a wasteland tends to not get you very much because you're not going to get a huge amount of boost from the administrative income or anything like that. And it's harder to keep units in there because of supply issues. It's not impossible, but it's harder to do. It just makes everything about it makes it less likely that you're going to be able to utilize the spell because of the wasteland requirement. Now, it is still occasionally useful, especially if you get a wasteland in a really good place, a really good location for you, if for no other thing except for the ritual range. Because being able to boost any given ritual by plus one range can be very useful and can throw off a an enemy. If they're not thinking about it, they're not anticipating the fact that you're gonna have this, it, it can be it can be very big. The other time that it can be nice is if it is used in a capital that is a wasteland, like Ashdod or something like that. So if you have an early war against a um, an Ashdod and you are victorious and you're able to put geoglyphs in that uh, location, that can be pretty nice, right? Um, so a little hit or miss there. Very thematically interesting from a spell standpoint, but unfortunately because of the mechanics behind it, uh, it, it is restrictive to use which is sad because I would love to use it more frequently. I'd love to have like five locations where I'm just like, geoglyphs all around of Nazca's territory. Hell yeah, that'd be awesome, right? Um, and it's not, let's be honest, like it's not, um, uh, it takes 18 as a base, right? To put it up and then it's one gem per month, right? So... I, I honestly wish that they would just let you put this anywhere, right? I get the restriction, but it's expensive enough that if you wanted to make a build where you were sacrificing scales because you knew you were going to be using geoglyphs to compensate, it's still expensive enough that that is going to take a lot of focus. And Astral Pearls are not just throwaways for you. Astral Pearls are how you get your Huakas. So if you're spending a shit ton of Astral Pearls on your Geoglyphs, making sure you have better magic scales throughout your nation, that means you're not getting Huakas, which means you're not translating... You're translating that information, that, that um, gem type into a different type of power. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a kind of a neutral thing, but it is a choice to make, right? So I really do wish that you could use geoglyphs in any location, or at the very least, use it in um, wastelands and plains, right? Like, 
just regular, not even farmland, right? Just regular plains, right? Because if you could do it in regular plains as well, you could make, you, you basically increase the amount of places that you have the ability to use it in. Um, and I think that would be really neat. Um, anyways, that is, uh, that's it. That's really it as far as Nazca goes. I'm going to jump into another little test thing as I, whatever, as I talk about the last few things. Um, I think Nazca is a really cool nation. I think it's one of the coolest nations in the game. Um, I think that it has a lot of unique mechanics going on, and I honestly wish that there were more. I, there are plenty of nations that have very unique mechanics, but I, I feel like, I feel like some of the nations in the game could use a twist of complexity or chaos, right, to make them a little more interesting, a little more, more, right, like more national items, more national spells, more national mechanics, right? Because Nazca is the only, as far as I'm aware, Nazca is the only nation that has this kind of like mummified concept um it would be really cool if other nations had more unique mechanics like that and some do there are some that do but i feel like the majority of nations in dominions are more hammers swinging at nails right they have a different type of hammer maybe but it's still a hammer um nazca i think is a very polarizing nation within the community i think people have uh a lot of people have very specific opinions um on nazca i think generally speaking that most of the experienced players most of the really and i'm i'm putting words in people's mouths so if i if if you're an experienced player and you're like bullshit then again hit me up in the comments but i think most experienced players Look at Nazca now and they're like, yeah, Nazca is strong. And if you can get to the late game in a good position, you can do really, really well, right? Um, but I think most expert players also think that Nazca is a fucking lame duck at the beginning of the game. They can get horribly destroyed because they do not have a good way to generate good troops um, without relying on their sacreds. And their sacreds, if you're going to, like, if you're going to go a bless, whether it's a rainbow bless or a hell bless or a very specific bless, right? You're going to have to invest a fair amount into them. And they are not, they're not multi-tools, right? They are not, they're not one size fits all. You, they are not giants. They are not elf cab. You cannot take a generic bless and then just throw five condor warriors at an indie province and expect to take it it doesn't work that way which means that you have to build a critical mass of all of these troops you have to be very judicious you have to try to not suffer a large amount of attrition and that's going to slow your pacing right slowing your pacing against nations like um Elf nations, giant nations, nations that just Ulmish troops, right? Ulmish style troops, just troops that are really good out of the gate. Slowing your pace against nations like that is very dangerous. Nazca has a really bad early game, and I think expert players know to punish that. I think the community as a whole has an outdated opinion of Nazca. Uh, because they feel like Nazca needs to be auto-banned because it's so overpowered, or it needs to be coalitioned as soon as the game starts so that it can't get out of control. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I think one good nation or two good nations can take on Nazca without any difficulty in the first 30 turns of the game, right? The play that Nazca used to have, the idea that, okay, you can come at me, but by turn... 12 i'm gonna have 40 or 60 um uh hell blessed uh condors really it, you can still do that but it doesn't have the same efficacy that it used to have right it's still possible but it, it doesn't work in exactly the same way anymore and even when it does there are ways around it right um there are ways for certain nations to be like Great, you have 60 condors. I don't give two shits. They're not going to kill my blessed sacreds. So when you throw those 60 condors at me, 
I'm just going to kill all of them, and then I'm going to come kill you, right? Um, so, I think the opinion that the community, as a, as a general opinion, has about Nazga is probably a little unwarranted now. Though, again, I do think Nazga is very strong if they're allowed to do what they want and get into the mid and late game in good style. If they get to the late game without a good basis, though, I don't think they're that threatening, right? Um, they can still do some things. Obviously, you should, you should not let anyone just have a free reign, right? But if Nazca is in a 12-player game and it's, it's turn 70 and they don't have two or three caps and they don't have a good economy going and they're not in a positive diplomatic position, I think they're probably dead, right? Or, or at the very least, they're, they're playing spoiler. They're not playing to win. Um, Nazca needs to make it to the mid to late game to, to get going, right? To take advantage of the awesome tools that they have. And when they make it to the mid to late game, if they are not there in a good position, they're not going to do anything with it, right? Um, if they are up against giants or elves or, or heaven forbid, good researchers, right? If they're up against like an Arcosophale or, or uh, like an underwater nation that's been able to like sit around and research, then I don't think Nazca is going to do much of anything in that type of situation. So, I think the general opinion is overboard on how overpowered Nazca is. I think they used to be very overpowered because the Hatan Runa and the Condors made it to where their big weakness, the early game, was way more manageable for them. Now, that is much less so. So even, even if you don't kill Nazca in the early game, even if you just kind of bloody their nose, that bloodied nose is such a loss of momentum for them that I'm not sure a Nazca that doesn't out and out win their first war, I'm not sure Nazca can really do much. Obviously, like, these are all caveats, right? If, if Nazca gets in the first war and they don't out and out win, they just kind of, like, stay around and they're small, um they can become a big threat later on if they're left alone, if they have good scales and a good economy, etc., etc., right? But that's not how people typically play. Typically, you get bloodied, you're small, you're food. Someone's going to come for you, and as a small Nazca, you're not going to be able to really do anything about it, right? Anyways, I, I, can, I can wax poetically about this forever. I think it's a super cool, super fun nation. I'm very excited to play this in a tournament. I'm so um, awestruck that I actually got to pick it. Uh, it's crazy. I, I think I am the only Nazca in the entire tournament. Like 16 games or something like that. 100, 200-ish people. Um, so that's that seems really fun. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm really looking forward to people telling me how bad I am and how wrong I am about Nazca um, when I don't win with them. So um, I'm also really expecting, just because of some of the conversation that's happened in the, the chat already in the channel, I'm really expecting to get coalitioned right out of the gate and i'm not really expecting to make it past turn 20 because again i think the the community's opinion is ah oh, fuck nazca kill it kill it with fire right um so we'll see how that all works out uh this has been an incredibly long video thanks for watching uh the next video will be the pretender design one which is uh, about an hour so um not too bad and then we're going to jump into the game. So uh, I hope you stick around for what is probably going to be a very short series. Fingers crossed. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye, everybody. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like, commenting, or subscribing. It really helps me out. If you'd like to see me live, head over to my Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash the distant horizon.